everyone. Thank you for joining in. Um, I'm Ramona Arora and I am going to be moderating today's uh, Women Creating Social Impact e event with Alexandra Criscolo. I hope I said it right. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I just want to kind of walk through what is Products by Women because I know some of you might be wondering. And so Products by Women is actually a diverse community, a network for women in innovation, tech and beyond. Uh, the network offers women the opportunity to connect and learn from peers from around the world, find jobs beyond borders, and get matched with recruiters and mentors to accelerate their career. Um, I know COVID-19 hasn't worked out and like changed a lot of lives, but for products by women in general, we've actually expanded quite a bit and virtually across US, India, Canada, Singapore, Amsterdam, UK, and more during this whole quarantine period. Um, so just a little bit about what's coming up next. Uh, we actually are having a future tech festival, which is going to be the tech festival of 2020. Um, it's going to be happening on 26th and 27th of September. So like four days to go, feel free to join and check it out on the future tech festival.com. Um, it's going to be focused on emerging technology panels, recruitment sessions, and during break time, you will actually in, get to enjoy interactive music performances by published musicians. Um, it's entirely free and just aims to educate and inspire those who are interested in emerging, emerging technologies and discovering new music. Um, feel free to register for more events at, at our Products by Women website. You can also sign up and actually nominate um, any females that you feel have been doing wonders and need to be celebrated through our PVW awards, uh, which are happening this year. This is going to be the first time we're actually hosting these awards. There's also a speaker interest form if you're interested in moderating an event like me or speaking like Alexandra is going to be speaking today. Um, so I guess uh, it's enough for now. I know you want to get started into what's going to be this, what all, this event is all going to be about. Um, so a little about our speaker, Alexandra Criscolo Ali is a Green Best 30 Under 30 recipient. She is determined to make sports and organizations more sustainable. She was appointed as the first environmental sustainability manager at New York Road Runners, where she developed and implemented sustainability strategy for the world's largest marathon, 50 plus annual races and multiple facilities. Uh, previously, she worked at Kickstarter as an Environmental Defense Fund Climate Corps Fellow and the organization's in-house in -house in environmental impact consultant. She spent the first five years of her career at GE Capital working in environmental risk and energy project finance. Alexandra has an MBA in sustainability from Bard College and a BS degree in finance from Fairfield University uh, with minors in environmental studies and Spanish. Uh, she was a Division One swimmer and enjoys competing in road races and triathlons. So it's so nice to have you here, Ali. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, Ramona. Really excited. I know we met at the Net Impact event, and yeah, it's great to be introduced to a new community and share some stories today. Yeah, no, absolutely. We're really excited to have you here and just would love to learn a little more about, you know, what inspired you to pursue a career in sustainability. Can you talk to us through your journey? Yeah, definitely. So uh, it actually dates all the way back to sixth grade. I remember I was sitting in Miss Shield science class and we watched a documentary on climate change and it completely terrified me but it made me really want to do something about it. And so ever since then, I took every opportunity I could to study the environment and sustainability um, throughout school. So in high school, I took AP Environmental. Um, and then, you know, in college, I minored in environmental at the time. Sustainability wasn't a buzzword yet, and there wasn't a major. Um, so I minored in it. And that actually led me to GE, um, which recruited a um, I had my undergrad in Fairfield um, and was headquartered, you know, in Connecticut. And so I interned the summer before my senior year at GE Energy Financial Services, which kind of combined my finance and environmental and was a great start. Um, 
and I continued with GE full time after graduation and I ended up spending five years with GE. Um, and so I started with their rotational program for a couple of years, um, went to another part of GE for a couple of years and then ended up coming back to the energy side to focus on uh, environmental risk. So um, I had a great five years at GE to really learn, build my skills, network, um, but I kind of reached a ceiling of where I could go without a graduate degree. And I also always knew in the back of my mind I wanted to go get my MBA. So, and also GE was experiencing some turmoil at the time, GE Capital. So it was just the perfect storm of events for me to look at grad schools. And I had actually heard about the BARD program when I was a student at Fairfield in Connecticut. And so I, you know, researched it, reached out, and I visited. And I was planning on, you know, looking at other schools and um, researching other programs as well. But when I went to visit BARD, I just automatically knew that was the program for me. And uh, I ended up, you know, pursuing my MBA in sustainability full time and um, had an incredible experience. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, it helped me to really pivot my career to make a sustainable impact with my career. And um, during my two years at BARD, uh, the summer in between, I applied to the Environmental Defense Fund's uh, Climate Corps program that you mentioned in my bio. And um, that program basically matches grad students throughout the country in around 100 different organizations. So I was matched with Kickstarter in Brooklyn and had the opportunity to work there for a summer and then ended up working there full time throughout my second school year, um, which was an incredible experience because I was kind of the first and only sustainability resource for the, for the organization. Um, and I was hoping that it would turn into a full time role after graduation. Unfortunately, they just didn't have the head count for a full time sustainability resource. Um, so while I was disappointed, it ended up opening the door for something that was, you know, dream job. I uh, got the role at New York Roadrunners, um, sustainability, environmental sustainability manager um, for New York Roadrunners, um, which you, I think you mentioned, uh, we put on the New York City Marathon and um, races almost every single weekend throughout the year. So um, I'll talk more about that later. But um, I'm currently on a furlough due to COVID, so obviously the pandemic hit, um, we had to cancel the 2020 marathon, and we were hit financially, and so um, a lot of the staff was affected, so currently on furlough, um, but luckily I had about a year of experience at Roadrunners under my belt, um, hoping I get called back, <laughs> and just, uh, you know, taking the time to really work on some side projects that will, um, you know, help me hopefully in the future. Thank you for walking us through that, Ali. It seems like, you know, you've worked in so many different places, but I think your humility and uh, modesty is just like, it's quite a bit. And I think uh, sharing the entire story is so important because even if, you know, you've had some hardships in the way, they actually shape you and make the future much better because you look at it more differently or, you know, you have more gratitude towards it. And I've personally learned a lot from you and your story. Can you like, you know, because you've gone through, you know, um, grad school and also at the same time have had experience in sustainability. So can you talk through some skills that have like helped you succeed or transition over the years to like, you know, keep going, keep moving forward? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd say four things uh, that I kind of always go back to. One is kind of following my gut and passions. Two is forming my team, which I'll explain. Um, three is just old fashioned hard work. And four is helping others. And so um, when I, the skill of kind of following your gut and your passion, I guess, uh, you know, going back to looking at undergrad programs and grad programs, um, there may have been schools that were academically better or whatever it might've been. But for me, like that feeling when I visited campus and um, the feeling of having a supportive community of students and professors that can help you in the future um, was something that was really important to me. And so um, I probably would have loved wherever I went, but you know, following my gut and passion in choosing school pro programs and jobs um, has just been something that's really helped. Um, and then when I say forming my team, um, I think throughout 
you know, my education and work experience, um, the more people who I tell my goals and my, my dream jobs to, um, the better because it ends up forming this supportive team of whether it's, you know, professors, friends and family, um, or, you know, work colleagues, bosses, whoever, or anyone I network with, grab coffee with in the industry, um, the more people who know, you know, my goals and what I'm reaching for, the more people who will think of me um, in the future if they see a job posting that's, you know, right up my alley or, um, you know, a, a panel session or something that might spark my interest. And so, um, yeah, having, having that team is super important. Um, and then obviously just hard work is, there's no substitute for it, but at the same time as sustainability professionals, you have to just be careful to avoid, <clears throat> excuse me, burnout because, um, you know, it can, when, I feel like when you are passionate about something and you love something, you can just work around the clock, but having that balance is super important so that you have the energy to bring your best foot forward every day at work. Um, and then helping others, you know, I love mentoring students at Fairfield and Bard or just people in the industry who reach out to me who, you know, need advice. Um, and, you know, in turn, I think peop other people who either came before me or those people sometimes, you know, students that I mentored um, end up helping me in, in return. So um, I think while those aren't hard skills, I think those are soft skills that really helped me, um, you know, over the years. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I think, um, I absolutely know how helpful you have been to me, especially like to everyone who joined the call. I met um, Ali two years ago at the Net Impact Conference. So that clearly states that, you know, for Ali, like mentorship is important, teamwork, network, find your support system and understand that, you know, these are the people who feel as passionate as we do about social impact and sustainability too. So why not connect with them? But at the same time, I, being an international student, was job hunting and Ali was, you know, there to help me out. And even, you know, she was like, okay, yeah, if you need a referral card, if you need it there, like, just let me know. We barely knew each other, but it was definitely a support system that we formed. And I think women empower women. So thank you for walking us through that. Um, you know, just to shift the angle a little bit. I know that you have been a swim team record holder an instructor in the past. So could you share more about the research and publications and you know, what prompted you to you know, research more around it and actually go ahead with publications? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think my parents put me in the water when I was like two months old swimming and I just loved it my whole life. And I swam in college and um, you know, now I love swimming, running, triathlons. Um, and my other love is sustainability and the environment. And so when I realized I could combine the two, it was this awesome epiphany of, um, you know, this is so exciting. This is definitely my passion area. Um, and my classmate at Bard, um, she came into the program with a focus on sports sustainability. And so I was like, yes, this is, this is my focus as well. You know, anytime I could choose a focus area for a class project or, um, you know, a paper or something, it would be about, you know, swimming, running, triathlons, that kind of space. And um, so I kind of just started looking for opportunities. And actually, I had a professor for my capstone project, the second year of the program, where you can choose a project in any area you want. Um, and one of the kind of tracks that previous students had done is um, doing a project in your place of work or your internship. And I, so I thought, perfect, I will do it at Kickstarter. I'm already working there. Maybe it will help me get a full-time job after graduation. And I was having the call with my uh, professor advisor and she said, okay, I know you love Kickstarter. That would be easy. It would be great. Um, but, you know, if you could do, you basically, this is your one chance in your life to do anything you want, any topic research um, that you'd like. And she said, you know, let me just stop you for a second. If you didn't do Kickstarter, what would it be? And I said, you know, sports sustainability. Um, ultimately, I ended up doing Kickstarter, but um, because I told her, you know, I don't think I can get a job in sports sustainability right out of college. So I don't want it to be not a waste, but you know, I don't, I don't want it to not set me up for success right after graduation. And, but I still think back to that conversation because 
um, I was, you know, really kind of down and challenged um, graduating without a job. I've always been the person who uh, has a job lined up right after, you know, before graduation, the next step in life always planned out. Um, and graduating without a job was a little bit scary. But then a week after I graduated, the New York Roadrunner job was posted and just about every person in my network and my team, you know, sent me the job saying, have you seen this yet? It's perfect for you. Um, and so, and going back to my capstone actually, um, so I did Kickstarter, but because she challenged me and because I was just passionate about it, uh, I ended up writing articles for, you know, Swim Swam magazine that I read growing up. And so that was a full circle, um, really awesome moment and doing a podcast with the CEO of USA Triathlon, an Olympic swimmer and a sports sustainability expert. Um, and, you know, I'll talk more about this when I talk about uh, advice, but I think um, all of these things are the only thing they cost is your time. Um, and when you're passionate about it, it doesn't feel like work. So I did things like that to build my experience and network and um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Like a follow up question that I have was like, do you think when you think about sustainability, you know, there are different segments that you can go in for. Um, are these projects, um, it seems like you've really used the projects as a baseline to get that experience in, to highlight it and then move to the next step. How much would you vouch for it considering you've done it? Like, you know, what are some of the reasons you would vouch for it? Yeah, so I think um, sometimes if you want to pivot in your career or take a next step in your career, um, you don't need to work in that sector for, three years, you know, if you put in the time um, to something you're passionate about, uh, you know, in your free time. Um, and nowadays, there's just so many platforms of things you can do. You can, you know, create a Twitter or LinkedIn where you post articles that you're interested in and the space you want to grow in. Um, you can start a podcast. Uh, you can write articles. All these things are um, relatively, you know, low barrier to entry. And yeah, like I said, it's, it's invaluable when you're um, wanting to either pivot your career or work in a different space um, or even you know if you're you, you have an incredible undergraduate degree but it's not as niche as it needs to be for um, somewhere you want to work so yeah I it's it's all invaluable um, experience I think no oh, absolutely thank you for sharing that um, definitely one of the things that we've commonly faced is, you know, we know the successes of people like, but can you walk us through some of the struggles that you have faced while, you know, defining the success of a project or successfully finishing it, especially in the sustainability sector, like, you know, you've worked on strategizing marathons. So could you like walk us through, how do you define that success? Definitely, yeah. Um, I think I could give a Kickstarter example and a Roadrunners example. So. Um, at Kickstarter, I was, when I first joined, I was tasked with, you know, um, trying to reduce the environmental impact of hundreds of thousands of creators on the website. So the creators are the entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs on the website who are making something or producing something. Um, they're all over the world. They could be making something in their garage or they could be, you know, um, having a whole like manufacturing operations going on so it's just it seemed like a huge overwhelming task um but i thought you know how can i make this more manageable and so i started just by doing a lot of interviews conducting a lot of interviews internally and externally just getting an idea of what kickstarter is um and getting a better idea of you know supply chain from external ex experts and um, just really conducting a lot of interviews and then thinking, okay, what will have the biggest impact for this diverse set of people? And um, ultimately confirmed that a website or it's called the Environmental Resource Center um, was the best kind of tool for this diverse set of people and um, ended up, you know, creating this center that's publicly available online and uh, it kind of has the potential to help over 340,000 projects across different categories like fashion, games, food, design and technology to reduce their impact. And it just provides really specific production tips. Um, and so, 
this was, you know, uh, how do, we talk about how do you define success? It could always be more specific or, um, you know, help a, it might be too generic for someone, but um, it's just getting started and getting these resources to people who may have never even heard of the term sustainability that are designing something that has a major impact. And also it has a lot of resources. So a lot of, um, you know, PDFs, videos, easily digestible information so that people can go and learn more um, from this platform. So, um, yeah, that's the Kickstarter example. And then for New York Roadrunners, um, as I said, we have races almost every single weekend throughout the year. And the timing with COVID, when it actually, um, when people started to work from home that week in March, was the week of our New York City half marathon. And so uh, we canceled the half marathon, and it was kind of at the beginning of, um, you know, cancel large scale event cancellations at this time. And so there was a lot of disappointment, but also people understood it was, you know, for health and sa safety. Um, and so, you know, that was the beginning of cancellations. And now up until today, just everything, every weekend race has been canceled. Um, and so at the time I was working on sustainability efforts for all the canceled race items. There's a lot of t-shirts, apples, pretzels, um, just a lot of stuff that was now left over from all these races. And so I was working with the warehouse and, you know, key stakeholders across the organization to make sure that that just didn't go to the landfill. We had to make sure, you know, there was a process put in place so that things were um, either reused, donated, or recycled, and, you know, tried to get the no donations in good hands of people who needed them, hospital workers, things like that. Um, and so, uh, I also, a couple other things I was also working on was educating the staff on some sustainability tips for working from home and infusing sustainability into the back to office plans if and when we were to go work back in the office again. Um, so I guess the challenge there was just how do you measure success um, when there's so much uncertainty and so much change every day um, with the pandemic. And so I it was kind of twofold. One was um, my team and I were working on just trying to continue our sustain, working towards our sustainability goals and not, um, you know, stopping in our tracks. And then also putting out these fires and mini crises as we could um, in terms of sustainability and trying to make sure, you know, there was an extra waste sent to the landfill. That sounds really interesting and first of all, so empowering and inspiring that you kept pushing forward, like, you know, even though the, there are these things happening, um, it's there's so much uncertainty out there, uh, you were still trying to provide the best sustainable measures to it and not deviating from the goal. So, you know, we find that really inspiring. And now I do want to like go to the next question, which is, you know, we want to know the, your proudest moments of your own journey. And I know you had some photos to, to share. So, you know, this is exciting. I'm excited to kind of share the screen again. So please bear with me. Yeah. Uh, while I do so. Yeah, while you're pulling it up, um, so I guess my proudest moment um, was definitely working at the 2019 New York City Marathon. <laughs> um, so I had, you know, spectated and cheered on friends at the New York City Marathon in my neighborhood um, years prior and, you know, with no um, knowledge that I'd eventually be an employee of New York Roadrunners in the future, um, just just for fun. And so then being a part of the team that, you know, puts on the, this huge undertaking, um, the largest marathon in the world and all the excitement that goes with it um, was just one of my proudest moments. And seeing some of my projects implemented um, that I worked on, there'll be some photos, but um, yeah, just being responsible for uh, studying each and every aspect of it in 2019 so that um, we could reduce the environmental impact of this huge marathon moving forward um, just had to pinch myself all day so um, and yeah just all of the years of work since sixth grade kind of led up to this moment in my mind and it was just a really exciting day and also a couple of weeks because the whole week leading up to it and the whole week after is just a huge um, you know so many events and celebrations and so this is a picture of you know woke up at 3:45 in the morning and took a bus over 
um, the bridge to Staten Island, and this is the sunrise, the morning of. And so worked, we worked with a partner sponsor, Chiquita Bananas, um, to have, it, if you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there are compost bins right there. So as soon as people are done consuming their apple, they can just throw the peel in the compost bin. <laughs> And this is the, the start village with the view of the Verrazano Bridge. It's kind of an iconic. This is where the, um, they televised the marathon the morning of. And that's me. And you can see a lot of uh, the Verrazano Bridge in the back. Um, this, again, this is at the start village. So all these people are waiting for their race in the cold and, you know, wearing a lot of clothing that they end up um, discarding before they run, obviously, and it's collected in huge bins um, by Goodwill and donated. Um, so these are the waste diversion stations that we debuted and um, hopefully, you know, they can be refined in the future. Um, it was a learning opportunity, but if you can kind of see there's uh, different bins for recycling, waste, compost, heat sheets. Uh, so we can you know, increase our diversion rate and keep less waste from the landfill. These are pictures of the clothing um, that's donated to Goodwill. <laughs> and the compost. And this is just the finish line, the elite runners um, and the winners running through the finish line. Very exciting. and the, the winners of the 2019 marathon. And this is one of the many uh, stages and bands on course. And um, so all of these photos that I've showed you, a lot of them have you know signage and energy usage and things that when you're attending an event and you're not a sustainability professional, you might not notice, but there's just so much impact that goes into, um, you know, basically our, the uh, arena is 26.2 miles, you know? Um, so there's a lot of impact there. And so I was basically going around and measuring, um, you know, how much energy we were using at all of these points on the course as well. And that's the finish line. And um, for those of you who aren't runners after the marathon, um, it's a little chilly and so we give out these heat sheets that runners um, wrap around their shoulders to keep them warm and um, they're actually recyclable. So uh, one of the barrels in the waste diversion station collects heat sheets. And that's just me. <laughs> This is wonderful, Nadi. Thank you for walking us through that. I think I've always been curious about how sustainability and marathons work, you know, together. And just like so many elements through which you can promote sustainability and do the best job through it. So this is amazing. And thank you for sharing these images with us. Um, to kind of wrap it up and then go through Q&A, uh, one of the final questions that I have for you is, any advice for professionals or students who, you know, who want to create an impact and work in the social impact or sustainability space? If you could share any tips or words of wisdom that, you know, help you stay focused. Yeah, definitely. So I'd say uh, three things, network, create your team and just get started. So uh, I know people may be sick of hearing this, but networking is just so key. Um, as we all know, and you know, you can meet virtually, you can meet up for coffee, webinars, conferences, like we did at Net Impact, um, whatever it might be, just, um, and you know, while you're networking, don't, for, don't be afraid to tell people what your dream job is. I sometimes, you know, I would say, my dream is to work in corporate sustainability. And people would always say, well, that's not specific enough. What's, what's your dream within corporate sustainability? And I'd be afraid to tell people because it seems so niche and I didn't want to pigeonhole myself. But at the same time, those people are, if you tell them what your dream is, so sports sustainability or even running sustainability, people will think of you as the running sustainability girl. And whether it's, you know, a job at New York Roadrunners or something that's tangentially related, they'll think of you and have you in mind. Um, 
and again, creating your team, just having that support system of people, I guess it's in line with networking, but um, you know, someone you go to when you need help revising your resume and someone you go to when you know you need that boost of confidence before speaking on a panel or you know just uh the person you go to when you need a connection to someone um just build creating that team of support is super important and then um just getting started i think uh like we talked about before it, the barrier to you know just do a podcast or write an article um and in the social impact space if you're not already working in it or if you didn't study it in school um you know building your expertise in this area is you know you can you can just get started right now and it doesn't have to be perfect you know you might look back on your old articles and say what was i thinking but at least it gets you get practice and kind of can grow from there absolutely thank you for sharing that so much this was amazing i really enjoyed our conversation and i hope everyone else did too but um you know feel free to ask any questions like this is your chance like you know get all your questions answered um feel free to type it down if you don't want to you know unmute yourself we would love to hear from you happy to answer any questions and thank you ramona <laughs> um i have a question for those of us not like professionally involved in sustainability beyond recycling and cutting down on plastic like what are some ways we might not think of to try and like help do our part and you know in our our little spaces yeah definitely um well i think that sustainability is tied to anything that we do you know it's even um what whatever industry you work in sustainability is relevant in some way so um doing your research on how it affects your job or your you know your university or whatever um is helpful and seeking out sustainability experts to kind of give you tips and things like that is always helpful but um some things i've been thinking about lately with working from home um you know it's a tough time for restaurants right now and we're kind of um encouraged to order takeout to help and um so you can really minimize the waste um by opting out of disposable items that you don't need like cutlery napkins and condiments and um online orders often have places to add a note or you can you know call in and request no disposables um and sometimes you have to call just to confirm that always helps um so yeah opting out um of those utensils for takeout is huge and um you also might be using a lot more energy while working from home um that you know you would have your lights off during the day while you're at work things like that um so you could look into powering your apartment or home with renewable energy um through pro providers um permitted in your local area so in new york it's con edison and you can search their site um i think a couple are clean choice and green mountain um and I, I could go on forever, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to those few tips. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else has any question? Um, don't feel shy. Ali is pretty nice. <laughs> well, I have actually I have another one. I'll go again. Um, since you've been so involved with running and swimming, do you notice that there is like a greater need for sustainability in one sport versus another Ooh, that's a great question um so with running i think runners think about they make a connection to sustainability more because they're running in the great outdoors mm -hmm. and sometimes when the heat index is too high a race is canceled or you know it's a horrible hurricane outside i can't go for my run so people it's easier to make that connection um whereas a lot of swimmers swim in indoor pools and they don't think about that connection as much you're not you know tied to nature as much um so on the athlete side i can see where you know running is easier to make the connection but um in terms of kind of governing bodies in the us or organizations um i think running actually as well um has has made more progress just because they're they're there's actually more money in running um because so many people run races and pay to run and um 
just economically, uh, there, there's the resources to, you know, pay people to consult on the sustainability of a race and things like that. Whereas swimming, um, USA Swimming has tighter resources and maybe not the time to look into those things. Um, but so, yeah, I'd say running kind of has the, the tie and the resources. Cool. Great question. <laughs> That was actually a good question. I never thought about it. So thanks for asking that. It's funny how we covered our optional question for today because that was also asked by Kathleen. <laughs> Wanted to know some good sustainability tips and she covered that as well. So anyone else, if you just want to like not even ask, Add any question, but just, you know, say anything. Feel free to unmute yourself and join in. And I also have my um, LinkedIn in the chat. So if you think of questions later, feel free to reach out. Um, always happy to connect with anyone interested. What's been one of your favorite side projects that you've been working on lately? Ooh, yeah. So, um, the tough one because they're all really cool. I think my favorite, um, the United Nations has a framework on climate change um, group and there's something called the Sport for Climate Action Framework. It's a lot of words, but it's basically uh, all these sport organizations around the world have signed on um, to make a commitment to do their part with climate change. And so I'm a part of this, uh, these working groups who are working to develop the um, basically list of criteria that the sporting organizations who sign on are kind of agreeing to, um, which has been super exciting. And I was actually supposed to go to London for the first meeting um, the week that we also canceled the New York City Marathon and the week that, you know, COVID, we started working from home. But um, our kind of annual meeting that was postponed is coming up in a week or two. So um, yeah, that's been really exciting to work with sports organizations around the world, like Puerto Rican Soccer League and the New York Yankees and U.S. Tennis Association to kind of come up with um, criteria for these organizations. That's really exciting. Um, I think we have one more question about what newsletters do you read to stay informed? Well, that's a great question. Um, so actually, Twitter is actually a huge resource for me. Um, I follow a lot of sports sustainability professionals. And so one of my favorites is the Green Sports blog. Um, it's by Lou Blaustein and he, you know, interviews um, athletes and people, sports uh, sustainability professionals in the space and just, he, you know, a few times a week, um, I get the, I read the blog posts and um, that really helps me to stay up to date with everything that's going on in the industry. Okay, we have another question. Do you have any advice for finding a career focused on environmental policy? Uh, definitely interested in working on policy at the federal level one day. That's exciting, Danny. I, I hope we get to see you do that uh, soon because share your dreams here. They're going to happen. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I have never worked in policy, but I work, you know, with the city of New York and we collaborate on a lot of projects. Um, so I'd say the same kind of soft skills and same advice um, goes for any industry, but specifically for policy. Um, BARD actually has, it's called Graduate Programs in Sustainability. So I did the MBA in Sustainability, um, but they also have the Environmental Policy Masters. And um, so, you know, same, same advice, kind of get as much experience as you can out of school and um, whether it's, you know, with a full-time job or volunteering with a nonprofit in your free time. Um, and if you have the means to and want to kind of advance your education, um, BARD has a great program and I'm sure there's a lot of good programs across the country as well. I know like with like, a follow-up question to that like mostly we have um 
for tech courses you know we have so many online programs that people choose to pick those instead of you know doing a masters now so do you think that are you seeing that changing for sustainability as well or pivoting a career would essentially mean you know because school gives you all these other resources would that be a better way to go forward for yeah i think it depends on the individual and what they want to get out of it and what um how they learn best um there's so many certifications now so i would just be careful that in terms of sustainability that you're you know finding reputable <laughs> courses and things like that um but the mba in sustainability is actually a little bit unique in that it's partially online partially in person um it kind it's they call it like a hybrid program and it's actually um a traditional mba curriculum but sustainability is infused into every single course and the professors work in the field which is why i just felt like it was a perfect fit for me um and so it's kind of like a mix between you know going to a traditional mba program and like getting a, a certificate in sustainability and just mixing the best of both worlds for that um but yeah i think it just depends on the individual and kind of what they're looking for got it thank you for sharing that yeah. um does anyone else have any more questions i have one question or really actually a, a question for ali in terms of what you see in the future. Um, sustainability, I'm, I'm, I'm an older person, okay? I'm not one of you young um, movers and shakers. <laughs> and um, I, I see uh, people, more and more people uh, being concerned about their impact um, on the world and, and sustainability in general. Um, Ali, how, how fast do you think that's going to grow and, and how quickly can the tide turn because right now it feels kind of small um yeah i'm just wondering where you see us going and how many years you think it's going to take the country to really do something Definitely. significant yeah um it ebbs and flows and i think those of us who study it all the time and live it um wish it would go faster <laughs> than it is but um i think sustainability um, or the kind of the way you reach people is connecting it to something personal. And so one of the projects I'm working on right now is um, letting people know that COVID and the pandemic is also, um, which is a very personal issue because people are, you know, worried about their own health and um, their own you know plans being canceled and whatever it might be and connecting that to climate change and um, it's actually very interwoven um, you know the more air pollution there is the likelier um, if you have COVID um, the death rate goes up um, if you're exposed to air pollution just there's so many things like that it's all intertwined and so um, the more people realize that um, and the more people realize that it's connected to them and it's a personal thing, the faster it will go. Um, and so another example is the California wildfires. Um, you know, the more news publications that actually use the words climate change when they talk about the exasperation of the fires, um, you know, the more people will make that connection that this is something that's affecting me. I can't go run outside because of, um, you know, the wildfires. And so, Unfortunately, the more, you know, crazy weather patterns that happen, um, the more personal it becomes because more and more people start to experience it. And it's not just something that they don't see and is happening far away. Um, and these weather events are happening more and more frequently. So hopefully um, people, you know, realize and start to do their part and um, do what they can to combat it as they experience it personally. Thank you for the question. Um, it's kind of crazy that it's taking um, such drastic weather patterns to kind of make people aware about the situation. But you're absolutely right. Like, you know, this year, because people are staying at home, they're getting the time to self reflect. And they're like, oh, no, it's actually due to climate change. And I'm like, we're realizing this right now. It's always been because of that. Um, but really hoping, like you said, uh, it makes more people realize it sooner. 
Mm. Right. I know it's 5.50. Uh, this, I mean, specific time. <laughs> Can you speak a little about sustainability in the organics and natural industry? That's one of the questions we just got. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert in this space, but uh, if you go to the Environmental Resource Center on Kickstarter's website, website um, there's some tips, you know, in terms of the industrial space and um, making products and things like that. Um, I guess obviously chemicals usually aren't the best for the environment, but they're oftentimes really necessary um, to industry. And so, um, yeah, I, I think um, trying to make green choices when possible is really important and uh, integrating sustainability strategy into the organization who's making the product um, is, really imperative as well. Um, so I'll have to do a little bit more research and get back to you, but check out the Kickstarter Environmental Resource Center. Thank you for that. Thank you for providing the resource as well. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about like what you were doing with, like were you working with people's individual campaigns? Like were people starting campaigns in the environmental space? Kind of what, what were some of the things you were seeing there? Yeah, so I was working more on a overall strategy of Kickstarter and um, the impact of Kickstarter itself through the creators. So I wasn't, you know, speaking one-on-one -on -one with the creators um, other than a couple just to learn where their headspace was but um, I was more working on how does this huge impact how do we reduce it from a Kickstarter corporate level um, and then I was also you know I um, faci facilitated their envi employee environmental team that came up with a bunch of goals for the year and projects they wanted to work on including trying to um, reduce the footprint of their servers um, things like that so, um, really good side projects, composting in the office, things like that. Um, and then I think one of the things that was really exciting was um, they have badges for the creators. And so working on um, things like an environmental badge, so it would signify to the backer, you know, if something was sustainable or green, um, they'd have like an environmental badge. And I was beginning to work on um, creators filled out this environmental section that was added to their project page which didn't exist before so that was cool because the backer got to learn more about their environmental practices and then the hope was that eventually that would turn into um, creating kind of restrictions so um, you know no single-use plastics in your project and things like that that you know eventually down the road um, it would kind of lead to something like that but yeah i was kind of working more on the overall strategy and kickstarter headquarters itself very cool thank you for sharing yeah thank you for all the great questions Anyone else has any questions before um, we end the meeting? Feel free to ask anything else. Yeah, again, happy to answer any questions via LinkedIn or um, I'm also on the Products by Women Slack channel now. So if you join that, <laughs> I'm happy to connect there as well. Yes, that's a great reminder to just add that link here so that anyone can just join if they're interested. We're also having the third episode next Tuesday, so feel free to join and sign up for that too. Um, but apart from that, I think this is amazing. Thank you for um, speaking with us, Ali. Of course.